friends and colleagues, uh, you're welcome. Um, I know we have colleagues from various parts of the world and the traditional greeting of good morning, good afternoon, good evening applies here. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, international webinar um, uh, organized by the European Public Health Association Law and Public Health Section, uh, its Ethics Section and the European Public Health um, Environment Section, as well as the uh, UK Faculty of Public Health, uh, the Groningberg uh, Global Health Law Research Center and a range of uh, uh, other partners. So welcome uh, colleagues uh, to this uh, webinar. Uh, this comes at a particularly timely time where there are a lot of discussions uh, ar around uh, climate change. And um, we hope that this webinar, which is largely of uh, public health practitioners and leaders and some po senior policymakers, uh, lawyers, uh, and a number of other colleagues um, to develop a strategic partnership to have this uh, discussion around importance of uh, strategic litigation to advance the uh, public health and the um, and 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 the climate change agenda at this particular time. I think the science is very very clear. It's no longer ambiguous. Climate change is a public health emergency, it's the single biggest threat to global health, peace and security, a crisis multiplier, and a significant driver of health inequalities. With the poor and vulnerable at most, who are least responsible for all this, paying the highest prices. The science is also clear that we're destroying our planet losing biodiversity, our species, the very things which give us life and form. The science has also been very clear about mitigations we can do, the things we can actually do practically. And the science has also been very clear that we are an independent, interconnected world. So what, what is happening here? This is not just an issue for science and technology. We need to question our norms and the actions we're doing. Is it normal for us to have continued competition, endless growth, endless consumption? Is it normal that in this small world of ours, some people are still hungry and poor? There are lots of norms which we need to talk about. And the other big issue is why are we not acting? I think strategic litigation is one of the tools we can use for action. So we hope that this webinar will build a strategic partnership between public health leaders and others to better understand this agenda and to work together around it. And next year, the Faculty of Public Health, in, in collaboration with the European Public Health Association, Law and Public Health Group, and a number of others, we're having a one-day conference on this so that we can focus on how we can work together to address the agenda. I think a useful case study of this has been the work of uh, Rosamond Adokisi Deborah and Professor Sir Stephen Gold Holgate, who have developed a partnership working together to address issues around air pollution. There are many, many other examples. But this was a local one from UK, from not far we, where we live, and we don't have many of these detailed case studies. So Stephen Holgate is actually with Rosamond. They're having a face-to-face -face meeting three, to, be award, to, uh, uh, to award this particular case study. So... They've shared with us some of their insights, particularly for this webinar. And some of you may not be aware, this is the story of Ella Rosamond Adokisi Deborah, who would have been the same age as Geta Thunberg now. And I will share with you what the mother said after we've heard from her, if she were alive now to world leaders. So shall we just hear what, um, shall we have, have, shall we hear what they had to say, please? 
Throughout her short life, Ella Kissy Deborah was exposed to an invisible killer. She developed a severe form of asthma and had numerous seizures in the three years before she died. After a long legal campaign by her mother and a second inquest, a coroner today ruled that excessive air pollution was a cause of her death. We will leave all the failures of authorities for another day. I want this to be about hair day. And she wanted to know, and yes, it's taken me seven years, but I've got here now. Um, I will go to bed this evening knowing that at some stage we can get a death certificate for her and it's actually going to be on there. In Lewisham in South London, where Ella lived, there was a recognised failure to reduce levels of nitrogen dioxide and particulates that were in excess of World Health Organisation guidelines. Nor was Ella's mother given information about the health risks of air pollution caused by traffic fumes. We've heard evidence over the last two uh, weeks which shows a shocking, disjointed uh, approach to air pollution and there is a clear need to uh, you know, put public health at the forefront of air pollution policy. The government says through its landmark environment bill, it's setting ambitious new air quality targets with a primary focus on reducing public health impacts. This is the route that me and Ella will walk down every day to get to primary school. And as you can see, this road is really polluted. But Anjali, who was in the same year as Ella at school and co-founded campaign group Choked Up, says it's not enough. These guidelines have existed for years, but the government has chosen to ignore them because people simply didn't know about the dangers. And it's something that I really hope that this case has helped um, highlight and helped bring to the foreground and something that will be taken into account in the future. Ella's mother says this landmark ruling is justice for her daughter, but also about the other children still breathing polluted air. Martha Fairley, News at 10. I'd, I'd like to welcome uh, Mrs. Rosamond Ador Kisi Deborah, a uh, clean air champion, a advocate for climate change, a teacher, and the mother, Ella Robert uh, Ador Kisi, whose cause she has championed with great dignity and courage for the past 10 years, leading to a landmark victory, which we'll discuss during this conversation. And also I'd like to welcome Professor Sir Stephen Holgate, who is an MRC clinical professor in pharmacology and many, many other, he's a distinguished academic with many, many other services to academia and science, but he's also a knight of the realm, a, a true knight who champions causes and issues, including being a clean air champion for various organization institutions and a partner in crime with Rosamond Ado Kisi Deborah around this issue around the world. So on behalf of the European Public Health Association, the UK Faculty of Public Health, the Association of Schools of Public Health, the school, uh, the University of Groningberg, and many other partners who are collaborating in this initiative, I'd like to welcome you both to this conversation and thank you for supporting the activities of our organizations around this, this matter. On December 16th, 2020, Ella Roberta became the first person in the world to have air pollution on her death certificate. It was a battle we had fought for for the past seven years. Ella became extremely chronically ill before she turned seven. She had numerous attacks and one of the promises I made her was I would find out ultimately why she had become so severely ill. Ella isn't the only person who has asthma. In the UK, 1.1 million children also have asthma and a contributory factor is the filthy air they are breathing. We all now know, as the inquest showed, what dirty air is. We can't see it with the naked eye, but we know it is killing us. So it is up to those in authorities, governments in the UK and across the world. They have a duty to their citizens to clean up the air. Children are our future. 
and they deserve the right to breathe clean air. Please act now. Thank you. We've got to take air pollution seriously. Back in the 1950s, when I was a young boy living in the north of England, I remember the terrible smogs we used to have due to the burning of coal in our cities. Of course, we all thought we'd sorted that out, and by 1956, we had clean air acts. But what's happened since? We've got a different side, type of air pollution. But this air pollution is out of sight, out of mind, and therefore largely neglected in terms of health effects. What's happened is that we've really come to accept air pollution as the norm, but we shouldn't. It's bringing forward deaths in here in the United Kingdom by between 40 and 60,000 a year. It's affecting all age groups from little babies to those who are older. And furthermore, it causes misery to so many people with chronic diseases. We've got to put health at the centre of the air pollution argument. And we've got to get our politicians, both central and local, to start beginning to think that they can make a difference in their communities by actually tackling the root causes, namely the proliferation of the combustion engine and the use of chemicals in our environment which are being released into the air just as we used to release chemicals in the water. Breathing clean air is a right for everybody, just as we've got a right to drink clean water. Thank you very much indeed to uh, Rosamond and, 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 and Sir Stephen. Um, there were lots of comments uh, in the chat, uh, wonderful comments, uh, sending love to Rosamond and Ella and remembering her. But I think this wasn't only about air pollution and only about Rosamond's story. Climate change is affecting children across the world and the voiceless mothers and children who don't have articulate mothers like Rosamond. So this cause is not only about air pollution, but it is around climate change as a whole, as this conversation, hopefully today, this webinar, we can discuss some of the action, some other case studies as well. But we want to share a human story uh, that um, is not just about statistics, it's about real people who are suffering from climate change. If you have any specific questions, we'll do this at the end after all the speakers have shared. It's my great pleasure now to invite uh, Dr. Maria Nera, who is the Director of Envi Environment, Climate Change and Health. This has been a very busy time for her and I've heard her even during the past two weeks talking in Boston around the world and a number of other different centers. And we're delighted that she can actually join this conversation and we can, we can support the work of the WHO around this. And also the WHO can work with us uh, as public health advocates and so on. She's got a huge CV, which, which you may be aware of, including with Medicines Sans Frontier. And some Spanish colleagues wrote to me to specifically mention that she, they were delighted that a Spanish person is going to say, but unfortunately we don't have translation and she'll talk in English. Uh, Dr. Nera, pleasure to meet you and uh, thank you very much for sharing your insights uh, around this. Welcome, thank you. Thank you very much and what a wonderful opportunity. My lot of love and, and energy and congratulations to, uh, can you hear me? I see people saying no. Is that okay? Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I was saying that a big uh, hug uh, to Rosmund and Hol Holgate. They are our champions and our heroes and, and, and it's true, they did something extraordinary. I like very much when you say, I mean, the, 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 why do we need to still fight for, for the right to, to clean air? Uh, we did it for clean water and it was a big revolution somehow driven by the, the, the public health community. I think now that the new battle is exactly that. Now we need to fight for something that should be normal, but we still need to go for it, which is access to clean air. And that for children and for all of us. Let's go to the political agenda these days. As you rightly say, finally, the world seems to wake up and realize that uh, COP26 has to be different, has to be less blah, 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 and more action. Uh, the world realized that air pollution is, is a big issue, and the world realized that we need to recover after uh, COVID-19, and particularly we need to reduce our vulnerability as human beings 
and, and, and putting our health a little bit more protected. How do we do that? Um, going again at, at, the, at the upstream, going again at the causes of all of that. And one of the causes of all of that is that we are destroying our ecosystems. We are polluting everything we touch. We are burning fossil fuels that are then killing us, literally. And I think, unfortunately, we have today a human case telling us that this is exactly the case. So we are going to the COP26 with what we call the health argument for climate action. And we want to make sure that the health community is behind us. That's why on the chat, I was taking the opportunity to share with you a letter that we want to be signed by as many health expanded family community members as possible. We have now uh, approximately 45 million already signing this letter saying that, uh, that the level of ambition and the level of urgency to tackle the causes of climate change needs to change completely. We need to escalate that level of ambition and the speed because our health is at risk. And essentially what we are saying in this um, health argument for climate action is the following. Climate change is affecting us. We know it, we need to take measures, we need to adapt, we need to make our health systems more resilient. We need to make sure that we change and transform, but uh, something is already happening, so let's adapt to that. But what we are saying as well is that if you mitigate the causes of climate change, the health benefits will be enormous. And most of those health benefits will come from the fact that tackling the causes of climate change will be reducing the levels of air pollution. So we have a fantastic, a phenomenal public health agenda in front of us. And when I discuss with the people working on the environment, they are always saying, we need to hear more from the public health community. We need to hear more pediatricians, uh, uh, people working on respiratory diseases, any type of uh, medical association, uh, professionals, public health in the broad sense, we need to hear you because you are still trusted. You, you, people will follow you, politicians will accelerate and citizens will put pressure on their politicians if they understand that what we are breathing is killing us. How can it be possible that we have every year 7 million premature deaths and instead of creating a, a crisis uh, committee in each country and saying, how do we face this? We are still going on a very slow uh, speed on taking action, still negotiating with mayors, with politicians, still giving subsidies to fossil fuels, still, you know, arguing about moving on, on, on a more uh, renewable sources of energy. And, 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 and even the health community, sometimes we heard this sentence of saying, well, this is not your business, keep on your hospitals, keep treating patients, therapeutic, therapeutic work, and leave the, the issues of energy, um, uh, urban planning, uh, food systems, uh, access to uh, electricity and, and water and sanitation to us. No, I'm sorry, no way. This is our business more than anything else. We want to treat our patients, of course. I'm a physician myself. I want the best opportunities and the best technology to treat the patients, but I want the people not to be sick. And if we want that, we need to raise our voices at the climate change, at COP26, at the energy fora, at all the, 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 the sustainable agricultural practices, uh, uh, meetings and, 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 and events, at the, the, the urban planning with all the mayors, and we need to make sure that people understand, particularly our citizens, they see clearly the connection between outbreaks, pandemics, epidemics, global health crisis, and the damage we are doing to our environment, to our ecosystems, which are responsible at the moment for 25% of the global burden of diseases linked to environmental risk factors that can be reduced and, and, and modified. So I think we have an incredible cause here, an incredible mission. We need to become all of us a Rosmund of the environmental health. So Rosmund, allow us to, to take your flag and, and use it for, for pushing this big campaign on reducing air pollution, on breathing standards of air quality that I'm sure that you, you are aware of WHO 
launched it in the last uh, week, I think it was, these uh, new air quality guidelines. Let's fight for that because it's a, it's a, it's a health or, or death. I mean, there is no choice on that. Fossil fuels needs to go. Uh, we need to accelerate and trans that transition to, to a healthy energy. And I'm afraid it's the health community, the one that needs to drive this fantastic cause, mission, or, or, or common sense uh, transformation of our society. Um, we will be doing our best at COP26, but if we have your support behind, uh, I'm sure that WHO will be there representing not just our organization, but all of us, any of us at any public health association and any single doctor, nurse, or public health uh, person uh, behind us. Thank you very much, and I count on all of you for, for helping us to, to move this uh, uh, as quickly and as ambitiously as possible. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nara, for, 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 your, for your useful words and also your leadership around this one. I know what an what a important and difficult time it is um, for that. So, so thank you very much for your, for your helpful comment. One of the comments, uh, Stephen Holgate actually said, uh, the, this brief interview we shared you as part of a longer interview, it's a 30 minute interview we've, we've done with him as part of the academic medi medical sciences using his work with lawyers as a case study for their strategic forward work. So if people are interested in this larger interview, but one of the comments he made was that I said, are you going to COP? And he said, no, because health is not have a high profile currently in COP. And a number of health colleagues have felt are confused why health does not have a higher profile. Quite clearly, it's a political issue and economy and politics are high up. But this was one of the co comments which, which, which say, Stephen wanted to share in the discussion uh, that, that why is health, and, and he is actually not going to be going to Glasgow, beside the fact that the room's costing a thousand pounds uh, ago. Uh, um, the other issue was that the, at the time of our conversation, there were new WHO guidelines, which are much stricter and I asked Rosamond, how did she feel about the new rise? And, and she said, it's going to be very difficult. And what the politicians are going to say, it's not possible, it's too difficult. So as public health people, we do need to have a narrative about the health impact on these issues. And also you said public health people have, we, we have got the water issue handled. There are millions of people in the world who currently don't have water. And should we do strategic litigation around water as well? Thank you very much indeed, Nira, for your very helpful comments and your continuing leadership. It's a great pleasure now for me to invite uh, Marlies uh, Hesselman uh, to share with us uh, her work around the meaning of strategic litigation. While she's sharing her slides, I'll just highlight she is part of the Global Health Research Center at the University of Gronenberg, who are one of the partners in organizing uh, this, this uh, webinar. And um, it's a great pleasure now to, to hand over to, to Marlies Hesselman. Thank you, Farn, so much for that introduction. And it's uh, wonderful to have the opportunity to speak uh, to you today a little bit about uh, this idea of using strategic litigation, so not just litigation, uh, on health, human rights and climate change, and to think about uh, different opportunities to strengthen this type of litigation uh, to maybe force much needed breakthroughs in the, in, in the climate fight. Um, I will keep my presentation short as a way of an introduction to some of the speakers that will follow after me and that have a lot of experience working with these cases in practice. Uh, but just to, 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 yeah, to introduce this topic and to get not only lawyers thinking about this in much more detail still, uh, but also hopefully inviting the public health community to join also in this, this, this legal fight uh, against uh, climate change, but could also be indeed air pollution, could also be water pollution or as these things are linked. Um, a first important question, as I already said, is, is the question whether all climate litigation or all litigation that is currently ongoing, is it also really strategic litigation? Um, and that is an important question, uh, because at the moment there are a lot of cases that are being held around the world, uh, and a great resource that is available for everybody interest in interested in this is the climate case chart of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. 
Uh, and you will find in that database that there are actually many ongoing legal battles uh, regarding climate change uh, on different topics. Um, many of those occur in the United States, but by now we also have almost 500 international cases. And as you can see, uh, a, a large majority of those cases are being held against uh, governments, states, local authorities, uh, but also to some extent uh, businesses and other actors. And they touch upon a lot of different types of uh, issues and problems, including, for example, issues like access to information on health risks or climate risks or environmental risks, uh, but also very specifically on the basis of, of human rights. A question is indeed, is all this litigation that is being done, is that done in a way that is strategic, uh, meaning that it is maybe perhaps not only about trying to win the case for a certain climate, uh, for a certain client, or is there also a wider story? Can this litigation be used to force, uh, to force greater change and to make society more aware of the issues? Are there ways of dealing with litigation in, in a strategic way in this, in this sense? So this is what I wanted to share with you and, 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 and invite everybody to think uh, on together. Um, let me the fact that strategic litigation typically have a few special characteristics. Uh, in the sense that they can be brought based on many different legal arguments or many different legal bases and raise many different legal issues. But we see in the international society that many of the successful cases that are being brought at the moment are rights-based. So they draw from human rights to try to get across the message that indeed these, these issues with climate change or with air pollution are about the violation of our rights or rights to life, or rights to health, or rights to enjoy or private family lives, or homes, uh, and many other different uh, rights. But it's not necessarily so, so that's good to, good to affirm. As I already said, cases can be law, uh, litigation, going to court is often, uh, in normal cases, about just getting redress for the party that is going to court. So I have a problem and I will try to approach uh, a legal procedure, or a court, or an administrative body, to try to, to win the case and help me with this particular legal problem. But what makes a case strategic is that there's often a much wider story behind it and around it. So you can decide to go uh, to court by not just raising your own issue, but actually taking the, the example of a certain client or a certain problem to expose the wider injustices that exist, to expose a failure or a gap in the law or a, a failure in politics or in legal protection and to also expose this more structural or systemic issues that are involved. Uh, climate change affects not only that one person that goes to court. Uh, if a climate case is one, it can have very positive beneficial effects for many others that are also affected in the same way. It is also a great way uh, of, of using legal procedures, using, using an ongoing case as a way of drawing attention from politics, from society, from the media, to create legal awareness. A case can often be uh, something that is ongoing for quite a while, and there will be a number of moments in, in the procedure of a case, for example, to launch it or to have the first day in court, where there are again and again moments to bring this case into the public eye and to explain why it is so important to, to, to also look at this through the lens of law or to raise this issue in a court proceedings, perhaps even as a violation of human rights. Um, through a case, you can also uh, strategically mobilize society. Uh, we have seen in climate case litigation in the past is that there are multiple clients in a case. Sometimes it is an NGO and together with many citizens in society. This has been the case in the so-called Urgenda case in the Netherlands, the most famous Dutch case that we have on climate change litigation, whereby the case attracted a lot of traction and actually people were invited to join this case as co-applicants. So actually the case becomes people's own. It's about ownership of this legal procedure uh, in that sense. Um, but it can also, of course, uh, again, attract attention and, and have society mobilize behind the people that are bringing this case. So you can see that, that bringing a legal procedure can become about awareness raising, but also creating social mobilization uh, in a much broader, broader way. Of course, the hope is always that a litigation case is successful, that you win. But sometimes by losing, it becomes equally clear that something is not right. 
At the same time, while the case is ongoing, there may also be the threat of law or the pressure of law that already moves politicians to take action whilst waiting for the outcome of the case. Or, like I said, because it's exposing injustices. So this is, let's say, a way of explaining how, how litigation can be part of a much wider uh, conversation on, on this. And I will conclude with uh, this final slide uh, because I think, and this is also what we hope to raise with this, with this webinar, is that there are great opportunities for increased health-based strategic litigation. And if we actually look at the number of international cases that are currently pending on health and climate change, or let's say on climate change, so the major international climate litigation that is being done at an international level for international courts and, and, and experts, then we see that the cases that are currently pending have major health arguments at their core. And I am interested to try to figure out how these health arguments can be presented in the best way with the best evidence and in the most convincing way. Um, the examples that, that, that you see here very briefly are uh, a case by uh, a group of youth climate activists, including Greta Thunberg and also some other great youth climate activists around the world that complain very specifically on the basis of the right to life and the right to health, that their health is being threatened in many different ways. Um, and I cannot explain all the different ways, but one thing that I want to stress is that this case also very clearly raises the issue of the right to mental health. So our, we are beginning to understand much better what are the mental health effects of eco-anxiety and having this, this fear of the future on children. So what, what is also the role of, of, of law and of governments to protect there? The second case is at the European Court of Human Rights uh, by Portuguese children who have been affected by forest fires. Um, and they are, of course, uh, not just afraid only for their lives, but also, as we have just heard about uh, issues of, of, of air pollution, not being able to go outside, especially when there are already underlying health conditions. The third case is by uh, Swiss senior women uh, who have uh, a great fear for the effects of heat stress. Uh, and they also ask their governments to protect them better, uh, including or especially by limiting climate change much better than they do now. And actually all these three cases are presenting this type of argument. The final case that is still a little bit less known, and I actually am uh, not fully sure if uh, the fourth case is presented as part of this broader strategic litigation yet, but it concerns uh, a claim by uh, a patient of multiple cirrhosis uh, explaining how increased heat and temperatures uh, affect people uh, with heat sensitive multiple cirrhosis in a very extreme way, leading to a uh, severe loss of mobility. Uh, and so in some cases, if it's warm enough, even to, uh, to uh, near paralysis. So this is a very clear example of a specific health case whereby a certain health condition is being linked to climate change and people stepping up and saying, Climate change will affect us in such a negative way. It will affect our ability to function. It will affect our human rights. We need the government to protect us. And this is just one case of one disease, but we know from the, from the evidence that there are many different types of health impacts that could be potentially made more central in different types of climate cases. As a way to sum up, one thing that is important to think when thinking about strategic litigation is to think about what type of clients, what type of health problems, what type of documentation and proof is there to compel courts to consider the health effects of climate change and to consider how this violates particular rights, including the right to health or the right to life. What are the particular legal questions that the case would raise, the specific aims or demands? Is it about helping a specific person get better access to, to their health and health care? Or is it maybe indeed addressing the underlying issue in the first place and asking for better climate change mitigation. But there are multiple options possible uh, and in, in deciding on how the case should be brought, there are different uh, options, options possible. Which legal procedures are available could be another question because sometimes it's not only necessary to go to court, but there are maybe also other types of administrative procedures. Anything that could help bring about a case and also bring about attention to a case. And that's the last thing I will stress. Uh, strategic litigation is hardly ever about just bringing a case. It requires a lot of preparation, uh, thinking about the wider question and issues that are being proposed and that are being, uh, that, that you want to make people aware of, and what is also going to be the wider media or lobby strategy and the objectives behind it. 
And so I hope that this is a good first introduction. And like I said, I think it's an invitation to both the global health uh, sector or the public health sector and to uh, climate lawyers to think of ways together, hopefully, uh, to seize on the opportunities. I want to thank you a lot. And if you are interested in any of these uh, developments and cases, uh, there's uh, two, two references here to publications that will soon be out that discuss some of these, uh, these cases. Uh, but so far, I thank you uh, for your attention and I look forward to the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much indeed for a very helpful presentation. There are a number of resources which, which uh, particularly would be valuable for, for, for our public health colleagues. Um, in terms of a collaboration uh, 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 around these uh, issues. And during the Q&A, hopefully we, we can move forward with that. It's a great pleasure now to invite uh, Ermina Kotiuk, who's a senior lawyer, a fundamental rights specialist with Client Earth. Uh, she's got a significant experience, over 10 years experience around strategic litigation and has also worked for European uh, Court of Jites and on, around, around human rights and also work with the European Commission and so on, and has been collaborating with a number of uh, public health colleagues around the world. And is, is, I'm, I'm grateful for her to, to joining this webinar to share her reflections. Uh, thank you, Ermina. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. That was a great introduction to the strategic litigation subject. Uh, happy actually to be part of the seminar and meeting a public health specialist because I, in client earth we believe there is a huge and important role that public health specialists have in a strategic litigation. Let me share with you my slides and I hope it will be a successful attempt. So what I will be uh, talking to you today, it's air pollution, health and strategic litigation. I am a human rights lawyer and been for many years in my career focusing on human rights issues, women rights issues, reproductive rights issues, uh, uh, minorities. And a few years ago, uh, decided to uh, look closer at the environment as I saw this uh, crisis which we are facing at the moment uh, significantly threaten our uh, human rights. So we need to change the way we think. Uh, I'm focusing in my everyday work about air pollution. So this is what this presentation will be focusing on. Who is Client Earth? Uh, the, the short slide that uh, we are actually a legal charity and our work is primary litigation. We do all, also a bit of advocacy, but uh, we are an NGO of lawyers uh, who litigate around the world for the environmental cause. And how do we work? And thank you very much for the previous speaker uh, saying that uh, what is actually a strategic litigation? So, in uh, client earth, when we work with the air quality, we do actually enforce existing uh, uh, legal framework on air quality. So I uh, put it here on a slide uh, reference to air quality directive, which is like the main tool in European Union to uh, establish a, a legal framework, a legal uh, limit values of uh, air uh, quality. We have a, a lot of cases to enforce uh, those, but we also use a rights-based uh, approach, as my previous um, uh, speaker uh, mentioned. So we do uh, also litigate before the European Court of Human Rights and on the national level. Uh, on the uh, rights-based approach. And I hope further on that presentation, it will be more clear for you uh, how it can be done and why those two things are uh, complementary. Because I think that um, uh, on one hand, the rights-based approach, so the approach which uh, focus on human rights can be very, very powerful, but at the same time, uh, it's important also to bring uh, small cases which focus on uh, uh, enforcement of existing law and compliance with existing uh, uh, limit values of air pollution. But let me start from why we think that air pollution is a public health issue. Uh, already uh, uh, Ms. Neira said that uh, there is a 7 million uh, people around the world uh, which are um, prematurely dying because of the ambient and indoor air pollution. So we know that there is an ongoing public crisis and almost in every public 
policy document that you are reading on the European Union level or um, a national level, you will have references to exactly that's what I've put, uh, allow myself put on the slide, that there is 4 million, 4 million premature deaths globally and 500, almost 500,000 uh, deaths in Europe to ambient air quality pollution. But still, uh, not enough seems to be happening. Just uh, last month, uh, WHO issued a new air quality guidelines uh, that actually stringent um, a guidance for the uh, air pollution, uh, which is based on, uh, on uh, science. So do current legal framework address adequately the ongoing health crisis? On this slide, I show you the first picture shows uh, what the current air quality directive uh, are limit values for certain uh, pollutants and what are the old uh, WHO uh, guidelines. So this, the first uh, table illustrates that there was already a gap between current legal framework and WHO guidelines. With the new uh, guidelines issued last month, this gap is even bigger. So, uh, one can ask ourselves the question, why is that and what we can do about it? Uh, the, I would like to take you maybe a bit of historical step. And the, one of the cases which I brought on this um, slide is a case decided uh, before the European Court of Human Rights uh, about asbestos pollution. The, uh, I feel like it's a very important uh, uh, case because it concerns employees uh, in the ship uh, repair yard uh, who were working between uh, 70, uh, 70s and 2003 in uh, Malta and were exposed to asbestos pollution. The court in this case have found that Maltese government had no or ought to have known of the dangers arising from exposure to asbestos, at least from early 70s, given the domestic context as well as scientific and medical opinions accessible to government at that time. Uh, I really particularly like this fragment of this uh, judgment when the court says that hundreds of articles or other publications concerning the subject and issue has been published since 19 1930s onwards, and many of them taken from reputable British medical journals. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, the applicants won, and the court decided that the government actually failed its citizens to establish adequate legal and uh, uh, practical framework to protect them from asbestos pollution. What lessons are from uh, this case for us? I think uh, for the public health uh, practitioners, researchers, and everybody who work with the subject of health, it means that your voice matters. Your voice matters significantly. And the courts will look uh, at the scientific uh, advice about the air pollution. And although there is a lot of science out there, we probably need to, uh, if possible, make those information more visible and make it make more loud about it. Because uh, in, that, in that case, uh, clearly and strongly, the court said that the states and, and uh, um, have an obligation to be aware of the science and introduce the regulatory framework based on this science. So whether air pollution is a human rights issue, I would say, as uh, it was said already today, that uh, United Nations uh, adopted a resolution in 2010 recognizing uh, human rights to water. Uh, similar resolutions have not been adopted concerning uh, uh, clearly right to clean and healthy air or right to a healthy environment. But I would argue that it doesn't mean that we cannot say that we have a right to clean and healthy air as a human right. I think, first of all, the entry point is health. We have, and very often in many national constitutions, but also other laws, health is recognized as a basic human right or a fundamental right. And from that, the right to breathe clean and healthy air uh, is considered as a human right. Again, on a slide, you have two cases from the European Court of Human Rights. One, 
concerns the applicant exposed to um, uh, pollution from the steel uh, uh, plant. Uh, she was living in a, uh, a close to the uh, steel power plant steel plant and was exposed to significant level of pollution. That pollution she was exposed to was exceeding uh, legal limit values that were operating at that time in Russia. And the court found that uh, uh, this, just the fact that she was exposed to this pollution ab above the limit values make her potentially harmful to uh, to some other diseases and uh, uh, affect her health and well-being. Similar case uh, against Georgia about applicants who were living close to thermal power plants. And uh, again, important aspect, because even assuming that the air pollution did not cause uh, harm or, or they could not prove clearly the harm effects from air pollution, just the fact that they were living in highly polluted areas make them more vulnerable to other various illnesses. From this, the lesson that we learn is that uh, the court recognized the link between the air pollution and our human rights are already recognized in the European Convention on Human Rights, like right to private life and family life, protected by Article 8. More on the global level, uh, I would like to mention that uh, there is ongoing work of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment and his attempts to um, uh, produce a lot of information, what it means to the right to a healthy environment and what is what right to breathe a clean air, what place it has in a broad sense in the right to a healthy environment. Right to a healthy environment has been recognized already by more than 100 states around the world. And Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment uh, tells us that this right has a couple of components. And there is safe climate, healthy bio ecosystems, but also right to breathe uh, clean air. He has issued a special uh, report on the right to breathe clean air, which also highlights state obligations concerning uh, right to breathe uh, clean and healthy air. So I wanted to highlight to you where we could uh, um, turn to what legal framework or to what guidance, legal guidance we could turn to build our legal argumentations. And also, uh, the UN uh, Treaty Monitoring bodies, especially uh, uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child, recently issued a couple of powerful state, part, uh, state party observations. So this is a document that uh, are issued against the state to inform how those states respect human rights. And uh, against United Kingdom, Spain, Austria, and recently Poland, the Committee of the Rights of Child expressed its concerns about the high levels of air pollution, often from coal power plants, uh, and the impact of this pollution on children's uh, right to health. So we see a clear link between air pollution and our basic human rights um, uh, that are protected by core human rights treaties. So what is the role of health professionals and public health professionals? We can learn that uh, already from historical litigation on tobacco in asbestos, that it will not be easily accepted, that uh, the uh, damaging effect of air pollution. So we need to keep repeating this message and keep reinforcing the inf uh, this information that there is a, a significant, significant health costs of air pollution. In client earth, we strongly feel that health professionals and public health professionals have an important uh, role to play and sometimes crucial role to play in many strategic litigation cases. They can provide uh, uh, expert evidence, for example, they can provide the research which is necessary to uh, positively conclude those uh, cases which are pending. And uh, let me refer uh, shortly only to the case of uh, Ella Roberta do Debra, because I think it's a, it's a case that uh, shows us two things. And one is that health impacts of air pollution are real and dangerous, but at the same time, that the role of air pollution in the cause of death of that girl was not given. As uh, her mom mentioned, it took her seven years 
to uh, finally have a death certificate that mentioned that uh, she died uh, of asthma contributed by exposure to excessive air pollution above the WHO guidance. But what's important, I think, and for us to remember that the medical evidence in that case was crucial to be able to coroner come to those conclusions. Uh, and further, uh, everyday, uh, everyday work of uh, physicians, but also public health uh, uh, um, professionals is important because uh, on one hand we have strategic litigation cases, but also like um, just uh, collecting evidence. I would like to draw your attention to the research that was done by Tim Navrot. It's a um, researcher from uh, Belgium who actually analyzed um, uh, exposure to black carbon of kids uh, in Rybnik, which is a city in Poland that has a significant air pollution from uh, coal uh, burning, and Strasbourg, which is a city in France. And he found by analyzing their urine samples that on average, uh, by 400, uh, more than 400% uh, times, uh, kids in um, Rybnik have more uh, black carbon in their urine. And this kind of data, it's also necessary for strategic litigation. Even uh, if we think about um, nurses or uh, doctors, like helping patients suffering from diseases related to air pollution to gather the evidences for their medical files that then can be helpful to use. Because the next thing I would like to talk with you, and very briefly, is the entry points in litigations, which I think are important uh, for strategic uh, thinking, how to build the case. So first, the entry point is standing and admissibility. One thing that the courts will look like, uh, will look, it's like whether a person who is bringing a case is actually exposed to this air pollution. I mentioned here a case, Janeczek, that was actually the first uh, European Union uh, case decided by the Court of the Justice of the European Union about um, uh, enforcing on of ambient air quality directive. So Mr. Janeczek was living in a very polluted street and he was keep living on that street to be able to hold his standing before the court. Then the health effects uh, of air pollution, especially before the European Court of Human Rights, the court will look at how air pollution is actually affecting particular individual, what harm is causing. Uh, in the context of air pollution or environmental pollution, the court said that not every environmental pollution falls under the scope of the convention, particularly Article 8 that protects the right to private and family life, but only the pollution that, acts, that uh, affects life of the applicant to the certain minimum level. And this minimum level is subjective and depends on various elements of the case. So for example, let me bring you to the case Fadeyeva that I was mentioning before. And in that case, the court says that this assessment of minimum depends on all uh, circumstances of the case, like intensity and duration of the air pollution, physical or mental effects, and in general context of the environment should also be taken into account. And in this context, the court said that uh, th there would not be arguable claim under Article 8 if the detriment was negligible in comparison to environment, environmental hazard inherent to life in every modern city. What comes for, for us from this sentence? Well, the question is, what is acceptable and healthy in modern city? And I think when we speak about the air pollution and the sources of air pollution, we know that uh, uh, Vehicles, uh, fossil fuel vehicles, it's a, a strong source of that pollution. In some parts of the world, domestic heating is a huge source of that pollution in the cities. So when we think about what we accept as a pollution in our cities, when we push forward what we want to say and uh, what we will not agree that this is acceptable uh, in the modern city in the context of public health and air pollution. The other... Um, entry point, it's evidence and burden of proof and causality. So scope of uh, judicial review depends very often on the what actually is protected by the legislation. In one of the cases that we were bringing uh, 
under the ambient air quality directive, the court said that actually the fact that ambient air quality directive has at its objective, not only protection of environment, but protection of human health means that the courts have a broader or stronger or deeper uh, right to the judicial review of the policy decisions that are taken by the government. Uh, then burden of proof and causality between air pollution and health effects. This is an important aspect and often will, uh, will be um, uh, coming uh, in the face of uh, lawyers when bringing strategic litigation. How to prove that the air pollution is harmful for the particular uh, person? Who should be uh, on whom should be burden of proof, whether we should reconsider this burden of proof in the uh, face of uh, uh, sources of pollution, who is responsible, who possesses the knowledge about those pollution. And the same of causality uh, uh, between air pollution and, and its health effect. To what level we want to have a standard of proof uh, to be able to say that we see this causality. And finally, remedies. What remedies are effective uh, when we talk about the air pollution issues, whether we speak about the compensation or speak of improvement of air quality? And in the, um, in the field of air quality, uh, in one of the cases uh, that also client Earth was involved in, um, the court said that failure to adopt the measures that has been uh, awarded by the national judge, uh, it's significant, it's very um, damaging because the failure to adopt those measures will endanger human health. So we see uh, that actually on every entry point on the, uh, during the strategic litigation and the life of the case, there is a role for public health professionals and evidence and science showing the link between uh, air pollution and health. And that link, the stronger we're going to show it, the better chances we have to overcome certain obstacles and barriers when we speak about the uh, uh, litigation, bringing cases, whether it's going to be on national level or on the regional level. And as the final point, let me uh, refer you to the uh, ongoing um, call for people who are suffering from uh, health problems on air pollution uh, to come forward and talk about their uh, issues. Household and Client Earth uh, um, open a call for uh, citizens in the United uh, Kingdom to actually be able to share their stories uh, in the hope that we can uh, bring more cases that highlight health effects of air pollution to bring uh, bigger pressure on governments and policymakers to actually align closer current legal um, uh, framework with the new WHO guidelines and close the gap that exists. Thank you very much. And if there will be any questions later, I'm happy to address them. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ermina, for, for excellent uh, presentations. And within the chat, there are a lot of interesting questions and debate going on, which I think it highlights uh, the importance of the issues you've highlighted. It's, it's my pleasure now to also invite uh, Mr. Richard Harvey, who, who, who is a long-standing barrister, in, in, in British barrister, but he's also legal counsel for campaigns and actions at Greenpeace uh, International, spe specializing in climate change uh, litigation and activities. And he also advises on people-powered climate justice to hold corporations to account, which I think is a wonderful little title, which I'm sure we'll learn more about how he does it and how we can collaborate with him around this issue. Uh, Mr. Harvey, welcome. Uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Wahang. Uh, and it is absolutely amazing to know that we're speaking and meeting with people from as far afield as Australia, Bangladesh, Azerbaijan, Puerto Rico, uh, and just all around the world. What a, a remarkable uh, grouping of legal and medical expertise, but pre predominantly, uh, I think it's the, the medical community that we really need uh, to get as much support from as possible. And we empower each other uh, in, in this search 
uh, for uh, effective climate litigation. Um, you see in my first slide here uh, that uh, wonderful uh, advertisement uh, for tobacco, um, more doctors smoke camel than any other cigarette. Uh, and it's, uh, for those of you uh, too young to remember the fight to outlaw tobacco advertisements that are as uh, illegal, uh, illegally and dishonest as this, uh, was a, a fought with incredible resistance from the tobacco industry. Uh, the comparison between then and now uh, with the fossil fuel industry uh, not only polluting our air and our waters, but uh, polluting the information that people are receiving on a daily basis. And you see this charming and completely misleading photoshopped image of a Brazilian boy fly flying his kite. This is from 10 years ago. Uh, J. Walter Thompson, the massive international ad advertising company, created this Let's Go Shell campaign for the US market. Uh, what a uh, Brazilian boy's got to do with that, I'm not too sure. What you probably can't read, and I've, I've enlarged it for, so we can all see, we all need clear, clean air, not just for today's kite flying trip, but for future generations who want to live and play under clear blue skies. That's why, for example, at Shell Brazil, we've created a fuel oil for factories that can cut soot emissions by 30.76%. Oh, don't you love the precision? It should help Raoul and his friends breathe a little easier. Just one of the many things we're doing to help build a better energy future. Let's go. Well, Shell's history in Brazil actually isn't quite so sunny because just at the very time that they were running this advertisement, pure coincidence, I'm sure, Brazil's Ministry of Labour and several workers' associations were taking Shell Brazil to court for causing or contributing to the severe health problems suffered by families as a result of land and groundwater contamination. They lost, Shell did, and they appealed, and they lost again. And then they quietly agreed to a settlement with lifelong health plans for each plaintiff. Uh, that settlement was achieved in 2013. And here in 2021, just a couple of months ago, Milieu Defensi, uh, with allies, Greenpeace, and a number of other organizations, uh, fought a case against Shell uh, on Shell's human rights responsibilities. Now, previously, it's always been assumed that human rights responsibilities uh, devolved only on governments, um, that only governments actually had a duty to protect your human rights. Well, the uh, court in, in The Hague uh, held otherwise. Uh, as we have campaigned for a long time uh, to prove that companies do have human rights responsibilities and they ordered Shell to reduce its global CO2 emissions by 45% by 2030 compared with their emissions in 2019. And they held that Shell is responsible for both corporate and consumer CO2 emissions, because of course, one of the great arguments that the fossil fuel companies want us all to accept is that it's our fault for using so much of their product, very much like the tobacco co uh, companies used to say. Uh, the court held Shell is required to respect human rights and that other companies, so it's not all about Shell, other companies have the same obligations as Shell. They, they too are responsible for reducing CO2 emissions. No. Could we go to the next slide, please? This week, again in Shell's backyard, just like the, the Hague decision, uh, we at Greenpeace, together with uh, 20 other organizations, um, took action directly uh, in R the Rotterdam refinery. And together with over 20 environmental organizations, we launched a new campaign to ban greenwashing by fossil fuel corporations throughout the European Union. 
This is in line with the fight to ban the lies big tobacco used to promote its deadly products with glamorous advertisements and sponsorships. Just draw your attention to the uh, headline here, environment and nature activists call for an EU ban on fossil fuel advertising. I lived in New York for 20 years and worked there as an attorney. And uh, I periodically would see the New York Post and think of it as a, a pretty right wing, uh, conservative um, Murdoch owned uh, rag. This headline is from the New York Post uh, this last Monday, uh, which is an indication uh, of how far we can reach uh, when we have sufficient determination and uh, sometimes it is necessary to take direct action. You see Greenpeace's uh, ship, the Beluga, uh, blocking the entrance uh, to uh, Shell's refinery. Um, we were removed from there by the very friendly Dutch police uh, about uh, six hours later. Uh, but the point was made and it got a wide uh, introduction for the plan to have a European citizen's uh, initiative to stop uh, or to, to ban uh, greenwashing by fossil fuel companies. Uh, next slide, please. We've heard a lot already uh, from Marlies and from uh, Amina on uh, the risks to public health in the UK, the uh, impact of air pollution. Um, this is a, a government statement. Poor, quality, uh, poor air quality is the largest environmental risk to public health in the UK. That's not a Greenpeace statement. That's a UK government statement. The annual impact of air pollution uh, means we have 28 to 36,000 premature deaths a year. And uh, again, as we heard from uh, Dr. Nehra, um, the ambient air pollution accounts for approximately 4.2 million deaths per annum from stroke, heart disease, lung cancer, and chronic respiratory diseases. And another quarter million additional deaths result from climate-related malnutrition, mal uh, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. But it's not just the deaths that should be the cause for concern, appalling as those figures are, it's the quality of life that precedes those deaths. Uh, all of you who have anything to do with diseases of this nature have watched the heartbreaking impacts on people well before COVID-19 uh, became an international crisis. Uh, there is an, already an international crisis caused by and contributed to uh, the from the uh, fossil fuel corporations. So uh, if we turn to slide four, we'll see that uh, asthma, sorry, the, the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, Asthma UK estimates that the annual cost of asthma to society is 2.3 billion pounds. Uh, and the UK government says cost of health impacts on air of air pollution are likely to exceed estimates of 8 to 20 billion. But they're only talking about the costs in terms of mortality. They're ignoring the far higher costs of morbidity. And again, to quote who, direct damage cost to health is estimated at between 2 to 4 billion US dollars per year by 2030. But this, again, doesn't include the health determining sectors such as agriculture, water and sanitation. So the air is one very important feature of what is killing us. Uh, but it goes far deeper than that. And you, again, as health professionals, know far better than we as lawyers uh, tend to be aware of how much work needs to be done to make governments responsible and accountable and to make corporations accountable. Uh, if we can go to our next slide. 
this is really, for somebody of, of my age, I've been a lawyer now for almost 50 years, um, it's not about my future. It's about my son's future. It's about all our children's future and the future of our, the next generation. Education is being sabotaged by these health impacts. Air pollution levels in 41% of British schools are higher than who deems acceptable, including risks of asthma, obesity, and mental disorders. Ella's case was quite extraordinary because not only uh, did this take place at a fairly low judicial level, uh, a coroner's court uh, is not uh, one of the highest courts in the land, and the coroner just sits uh, on his own, uh, listening to evidence uh, from uh, the medical profession, amongst others, about causes of death. But this coroner was aware of powers that had never actually been used before. They'd been sitting in the coroner's handbook for years, but they'd never been used before. And he took out his handbook and he said, well, I've got the power to send my findings to everybody who I think should be taking notice and doing something about it. Uh, and I can require all of those bodies to respond to me uh, within 56 days uh, about what it is they plan to do. And so he sent his findings to three national government departments, ministries, three local government departments, to the General Medical Council, to the Health Education England, to Nursing and Midwifery Council, the Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, the Royal College of General Practitioners, uh, NICE, and the British Thoracic Society. All of them responded as required by law within the 56 states, and all of them recognized the urgent need for action. But there's another element that has been talked about today, which is an invisible one, and that's climate anxiety, what I call pre-traumatic stress. This is increasingly being recognized by the psychiatric profession uh, in a Lancet survey of 10,000 youth in 10 countries in the global north and global south. 59% uh, of the youth reported that they were extremely worried and 84% that they were at the very least uh, moderately worried about climate change and what it was going to do to their futures. And in fact, today, uh, as it was revealed that uh, the fossil fuel industry is being subsidized, at, and I know you're hearing a lot of figures, a lot of statistics, and it, it, it boggles my mind, uh, but fossil fuel industry is being subsidized at the rate of 10, sorry, $11 million a minute. $11 million a minute being subsidized by whom? By you, by me by our governments uh, at the time when children's health experts are finding climate anxiety is weighing heavily on our youth and air pollution is closing our children's schools all around the world. Mexico, India, China, France have seen school closures just in the last two years due to air pollution. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is about human rights. It is about the impact of human rights. Uh, Ermina mentioned just now uh, the important role of the UN Special Rapporteur uh, on climate change, uh, sorry, on, on, on uh, the environment and human rights, David Boyd, who is a remarkable figure. Um, today and tomorrow, the United Nations Human Rights Council is considering a resolution in favor of a global right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And tomorrow they are expected to vote on that right. And uh, we expect uh, a resounding vote in favor of that right uh, by all of the governments that are members of the Human Rights Council. Uh, we'll watch them carefully to see how they all behave. The Cases that are going now to the European Court of Human Rights include two that have uh, been through uh, the 
normal domestic courts uh, of their respective countries, that's uh, Norway uh, and Switzerland, um, what we call the People versus Arctic Oil case uh, in Norway, uh, which I've been working on for the last six years, uh, and the Klima Seniorinnen, the Swiss Climate Senior Women case uh, in Switzerland, uh, which I've also been doing quite a bit of work on. Uh, these are cases uh, where governments are being challenged uh, on their uh, own insufficient climate ambitions uh, and their own inactivity. Norway, of course, is one of the big explorers uh, for fresh uh, supplies of oil and gas in a world that cannot afford to burn any more oil and gas than we have already discovered. It's an absolute uh, outrage and what uh, uh, David Boyd has called the Norwegian paradox, that a country generally seen as uh, a country that is concerned about human rights and the environment is doing so much damage to both. Uh, and we all think of Switzerland as being this lovely, pristine, clean, alpine country. But the extreme heat waves that have threatened the lives uh, of any woman over the age of uh, 75, uh, and women are uh, more acutely targeted than men, uh, is a very important case. The government says, basically, you haven't got to two degrees yet, so there's nothing to worry about here. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, of course, uh, not generously to the Swiss authorities, but it is, it really does come down to that. Come back in a few years' time, uh, you elderly women, and then we may look at your case. Uh, we're saying that's not acceptable. We're taking that to the European Court. Um, and the Portuguese youth case that has already been mentioned uh, is already uh, at that court. Frankly, uh, did I think that that court would even treat a case that had never even been to it through its domestic legal procedures? Uh, I was very, very doubtful indeed. Uh, but the court said, no, this is an issue where these Portuguese youth are accusing 33 national, national members uh, of uh, the Council of Europe, 33 different countries, of responsibility for aggravating uh, climate change. Uh, and uh, we aren't going to decide that they don't have standing simply because they haven't uh, taken 10, 15, 20 years to go through their domestic court procedures. We think this case is one that needs to be answered now by uh, each of the countries that they are calling out. And so we're now looking at the responses of 33 countries who all say, of course, well, not our responsibility yet. Uh, these kids have got to go through uh, domestic procedures. Uh, I don't think that, that argument's going to fly. We'll see. And finally, in the uh, area of international human rights impacts, the most vulnerable communities in the world, arguably, are Pacific Islanders, whose very nations are threatened with extinction uh, Vanuatu has just launched a worldwide campaign for the UN General Assembly to get an, authority, an authoritative advisory opinion from the World Court on what are the legal responsibilities owed to people for climate change. So watch this case. It's going to be a very interesting one. Next slide, please. So here we've got uh, another one fights the dust. So I, I just have to throw that one in there because it looks so good. Uh, legal tools to clean the air. At least 155 states are legally obligated through treaties, through their constitutions and through legislation to respect, protect and fulfill the right to a healthy environment. We've seen the scale of the problem and what causes and contributes to millions of premature deaths and billions of damaged lives. We know that more than 90% of the world's population lives in regions that exceed WHO guidelines for healthy ambient air quality. And over 6 billion people, including 2 billion children, are breathing air that has adverse con consequences 
for their health and well-being. So final slide, please. You see the Trojan horse being hauled in uh, to Glasgow as the fossil fuel corporations welcoming uh, their net zero promises uh, and asking the world to accept that this works. I think we know, all of us in this virtual room, that carbon offsets do not work, that carbon capture and storage is a chimera, does not uh, exist at scale, and that the empty promises of net zero add up to a hell of a lot more than zero. These are human rights calamities. If you're a citizen of the CU, uh, of the EU, you can take one small but very important step today uh, by signing the Ban the Fossil Fuel Ads petition. And I'm going to throw that up in the chat, if I may, because together, public health practitioners climate litigators and public policy makers are coming together to protect the public health for future generations. We managed to ban big tobacco from sponsoring and uh, sports and advertising their lies. We must and can ban fossil fuel propaganda. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Richard, and an excellent, very, very helpful and powerful uh, presentation. And um, certainly I know that many medical rural colleges and so on have um, stopped investing in fuels. And, and we need to now work together on how we can accelerate this agenda uh, further together. Just finally, I just want to, um, as a discussant, I just want to ha give... Um, uh, in, in, in invite Dr. Marina Romanello, who is director of the Lancet Countdown, uh, just to share some initial ref reflections, so on, before we have the panel discussion of everybody. Uh, she's counting down. I'm not exactly what she's counting down. A uh, lot of it is to do with numbers and all that. But as you know, it's about individuals. A uh, lot of people who don't have a voice are difficult to count. Uh, she just published a new report, and she's a public health leader in her own right. So, Marina, do you just want to share some reflections on what you've heard uh, before we go into the panel discussion? Welcome, Dr. Ramanila. Yes. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you today. And thank you so much for my mind is blown. This has been such a an useful and important discussion that we've had today. Uh, we've heard from Ella Story and her mom. Uh, Rossman, who is absolutely admirable, and that groundbreaking case where for the first time we had in a death certificate, we have the cause of death being air pollution, and how important the law is in kind of pinning down that culprit. We've also heard from Maria Nira, she was uh, highlighting those 7 million premature deaths each year, and was the extreme urgency of COP26 in enabling change, the urgent change that we need to protect human health, protect human rights, uh, from air pollution and how air pollution is so closely linked to climate change. The sources of emissions are by and large the same. Maria said, we're destroying our ecosystems. We're burning fossil fuels that are literally killing us. We've also heard a lot about the key roles of medics as guardians of our health and well-being, and the importance of the health professionals in being able to incorporate their views into policy making, to work closely with urban planners, with energy experts, to ensure that policies actually do protect the human right to good health. We heard also from Marlis, and she presented uh, an overview of what strategic litigation is and why it's so important that public health professionals, scientists and policymakers understand what the process is and what the tools are for us to work together. Um, she presented to us the enormous power of strategic litigation in first exposing human rights violations, but also in driving change, even before we get to that final outcome in generating that societal, uh, societal and also the shift in, in the policy and decision makers as a response to that litigation process. Irmina from Clients of the Earth, gave an amazing presentation as well about their work and how they approach strategic litigation, uh, talking to us about the need and the fundamental importance of scientific evidence and of medical evidence in making those cases. So again, highlighting the role of the medical professionals 
in being able to provide the evidence in a way that is accessible, in a way that is easy to understand about not only the risks of these exposures, of these environmental exposures, both to chemicals and to the climate, but also in being able to pin down the causality of the health impacts that we're seeing. And there's where scientific information becomes so important. And Richard, with the wonderful job that Greenpeace has been doing throughout the years, in being able to defend, expose, and protect the rights to safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environments. And again, exposing the urgent need for public health practitioners, climate litigators, and policymakers to come together and talk to each other in making um, this change possible. As uh, Parhang said, I work for the Lancet Countdown. I'm the research director for the Lancet Countdown. And what we do is year on year produce data and evidence on indicators that track the health dimension of climate change. We produce indicators that track the health impacts of climate change across all the dimensions that we can measure. But we also track what the government's response is being and what that implies for health, both through the protection of health and through delivering what we call the health co-benefits of rapid climate change action. What we see year on year in our data is that climate change is having already impacts to the health of people all around the world. Obviously, the most vulnerable are the ones that are impacted generally the most, but no one is being left untouched. We saw heat waves this year throughout uh, the Northern Hemisphere, Canada, the US. Uh, we've seen the floodings in, in, in Germany this year as well, uh, Russia affected by extreme heat. So no one is really being left untouched. That extreme heat is generating direct deaths particularly in the vulnerable groups, the people over 65, but it's also generating a loss in labor capacity. People cannot work if it's so hot. They cannot actually um, do work outdoors. So we're also seeing a loss in labor capacity that our estimates are of about 5% of the GDP in lower middle income countries. We're also seeing the spreading of infectious diseases. We're seeing risks to our food and our water security and direct damage from extreme weather events. All of this has a huge human costs in terms of deaths, in terms of mor morbidity, but also has an economic cost in terms of the requirement for more health care, of loss of work of hours, of having to skip work because you're too sick to go to work. On the other hand, we're seeing that climate change action could be an enormous opportunity for better health. It could reduce air pollution that we saw today. We've heard over and over the enormous impact of air pollution on people around the world. It could deliver better diets, it could deliver safer streets, and it could deliver more physical activity and a healthier lifestyle. So there's really no reason why we shouldn't be making that transition. Today, the technology is there, and we can generate a sustainable economy through renewable energy. The outrageous thing of all of this is that today, we're still funding through public, through taxpayers' money, fossil fuels. Countries around the world are still spending money financing fossil fuels, and we have data, we produce data on the Lancet Countdown that shows that often the money being put by governments for fossil fuel subsidies represents a big percentage of the money that they put for protecting our health through the public health system. So we're financing the destruction of our health, the violation of our human rights, and the violation of children's rights to a healthy environment where they can thrive. The IMF did a report uh, a short while ago where it showed that all in all, the, the governments of the world are spending 11 million per minute in subsidizing fossil fuels, which is absolutely outrageous. So as we go to COP26, we really need to demand action. And this has been an incredibly inspiring talk about how the scientific and the public health community can work with the litigators and, and, and the law uh, experts to be able to drive that change and ensure that we protect the health and the human rights of all around the world. Um, just to close uh, my remarks, we are launching the 2021 report of the Lancet Countdown with new data across all of these domains that I've been talking about on the 21st of October. So I will just pop a link in the chat. So please do join us because it's going to be an interesting conversation. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Perhaps we could also count down around the legal stuff also, because I noticed in your recent Lancet paper, uh, the L word, nor the ethic word. Uh, this is uh, the the the, um, the faculty ethics committee and the UFA law ethics committee collaborates usually in these law webinars. 
and I didn't see neither ethics nor law mentioned. And if it's to do with norms and values rather than just numbers, uh, sorry, I'm a little bit advocate, even when I'm not supposed to be. But other we're going to have a conversation, Farhan. Uh, but but but, but I think one of the outcomes is we need to use all the tools. Um, Thank you very much indeed for the for the for the excellent presentations. Uh, I, I just want to in, in, introduce Dr. Amandine, Professor Amandine Gard, who is the um, president of the European Public Health Law and Public Health Section. This is a new section uh, we, 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 which which is lead, leading. If anybody wants to join, uh, it's free, and and please send me an email. We can, we, we, you can all join. And there will be a specific uh, set conference uh, six months time on this. But she's kind of been um, monitoring the chat and the uh, and some of the Q and A. So together we're going to sort of share because I couldn't see all the questions and I needed a legal partnership. And this is a demonstration of partnership in action. So, uh, Amandine, you, you're welcome to this conversation. Uh, would you like to sort of kick us off at some of the major questions and so on, please? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, Farang, on behalf of us, of us all today, uh, may I thank you for your expert chairing. Uh, I would also like to add my thanks to all the speakers for their excellent, but also very complimentary uh, presentations and remarks. So, uh, so thank you very much indeed. Now, what strikes me uh, very clearly is the urgent call for a more joined up approach between the public health and the environment communities. And of course, these workshops will hopefully contribute to uh, creating this momentum for more interaction. But we've heard very clearly that um, uh, climate change uh, is both a health and a human rights issue, and therefore there are duties of state to act. And that came out very clearly, both from Irmina's and uh, Richard's presentation. But we've heard that progress is extremely slow. And that was uh, one of the key messages of uh, Marianera's presentation uh, and others. So strategic litigation, the very fact that we have to resort to litigation is a sign that uh, progress is very slow indeed. You don't start to litigate if things can be done differently for the reasons Hermine and uh, Richards have highlighted. So the questions have been many because we've talked on many topics and you will forgive me for having attempted, probably badly, but having attempted to group them under some themes and uh, could the participants forgive me for not being able to uh, probably uh, do justice to the richness of what's going on in the chat and the Q&A. So um, there are some very, very specific questions that I'm going to put to to the panel and I think we can deal with them relatively quickly and then I would like to open up to a broader theme. So one of the uh, uh, first questions uh, that, that come to, to light is we've talked about the harm that pollution has caused to specific individual and society as a whole, but do we know of legal action from people who have decided not to have children because of the harm that their uh, newborn could suffer should have they decided to go ahead with having children. So that's one uh, first specific question. And the second specific question, I'll give them both and then the panel can answer uh, one or both of them, is do we have any uh, information as, and standards on indoor air quality and air pollution, bearing in mind that we spend an awful lot of time indoors and of course COVID has made this even more so. Um, so uh, I'll open up to these two uh, questions. And I think after that, we can uh, continue with other uh, questions that are of a more perhaps broader nature. Richard? I, I can at least respond to the first question and I tried to do so in the uh, question chat as well. Uh, at least one of the uh, co-plaintiffs in the uh, Norwegian case that we're taking to the European Court. I say we, we're taking, uh, we're still waiting to hear from the court that they're going to admit us, but uh, fingers crossed, uh, uh, we'll be taking there. One, uh, 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 a couple of those uh, co-plaintiffs have all have also raised this question uh, that they are concerned about whether or not it makes any kind of sense uh, to bring children into the world 
that uh, we are so busily destroying. And so, yes, it is uh, a concern that we believe can, will and should be considered as part of the uh, Article 8 rights to family life under the European Convention. Marlies and then Yamina. Yes, it's an excellent uh, question. And I can maybe add to that also in relation to one of the questions that we tried to answer already in the chat a little bit by uh, Walid. Um, I also know that in the, the UN case at the Committee on the Rights of the Child, so the Greta Thunberg case, uh, these arguments are made by the children in that case. So they stress their, their anxiety about what their future life would look like, including their ability to found a family. Um, and this is to some extent, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it's actually related also to their right to, to private and family life, but uh, it also seems to be tied to their right to mental health. And uh, this was the question that was asked by one of the, 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 the participants, sorry. Um, and we see, I, I can clearly see that, especially in, in cases brought by children, this idea of mental health is very visible in their cases. In the uh, in the case at the Committee on the Rights of the Child, it is an explicit argument uh, and the, the children explicitly raise their right to mental health as related to anxiety, uh, stress, uh, concerns about the future. And also the Portuguese children, uh, if you read the case carefully, uh, they, they also raise these issues, uh, including as they, for example, are sometimes forced to stay indoors while fires are raging and they are unable to go out and meet with friends, play to enjoy the outside. Uh, and this is also weighing heavily on their on their mental uh, health because this may be a recurring thing that they need to go through every year uh, if these fires are seasonal. So these arguments are very clearly being raised and I think that there will be an opportunity for international courts to soon say something about this. Maybe it is also good to point out that as far as I've understood is that uh, one of the cases uh, at the European court, the, the Portuguese case about the forest fires, uh, it initially raised the right to life and the right to private life, but I've understood that the court itself also added the possibility of violations even of inhuman and degrading treatment and the right to property. And certainly in the context of inhuman and degrading treatment, uh, this, this fear, this anxiety that is imposed almost, uh, let's say, imposed externally because there is not sufficient climate action, I think leaves open important, interesting questions of, of new legal arguments as well. You want to add, Yamina? No? That was very comprehensive answer. Exactly. This is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Marina, your hand is up. Yeah, I can just comment very slightly on the um, indoor air pollution. That is a major issue because that's where, as you said, we spend most of our time. Um, there's a lot of work going on and the WHO is actually helping uh, with the sustainable development goals, principally on ensuring that we're providing people with clean energy in the home. The main sources of air pollution inside the home have to do with the dirty uh, fuels for cooking, the dirty technologies for cooking. And that's an important case because most of those there are public services that are being provided and people don't have the capacity to access to different services in many cases. So the use of fuels in the home is a key issue um, that can be addressed. And although it's very hard to monitor and to model what indoor air pollution is, you can infer it according to the type of, use, of fuel that is being used. Uh, Yamina? On this, I would like to thank you very much. On this, I would like to just add that when we talk about the uh, indoor air pollution and generally exposure to uh, indoor uh, environmental aspect uh, health issues, the women are a particularly vulnerable group because um, especially uh, in certain parts of the world, this is uh, women who are preparing food, they ex the, this women who are cleaning. So actually uh, environmental hazards from chemical pollution, but also indoor pollution, and connected with cooking and using for fossil fuel for cooking, uh, that's uh, putting women in a vulnerable position. And from this perspective, I think it's also a gender uh, issue. So just to add on what Dr. Uh, Romanello said. If I, I'll give you the floor for one minute, Marlies, uh, and then I'll move on to other questions. Please go on. Yes, maybe to very quickly add the uh, so the WHO has these standards on indoor air pollution, fuel, household fuel combustion, but also my own research and other area of research that I do is on the right to clean and healthy energy. Uh, and I can tell that also in the human rights law framework, there is recognition of the fact that indoor air pollution, especially through the use of wood or kerosene or harmful fuels, is considered a violation also of 
the right to health with concrete recommendations to move away from, from these types of harmful fuels. So it's an interesting aspect to explore because I don't think there's much litigation on it yet. Thank you uh, very much indeed for answering both questions that were pretty distinct. Uh, I'm going to do the same uh, uh, with uh, the next batch of questions. Uh, I would like to focus a bit more on the rights of the child that we've mentioned and that we link, I think, to a question that a very interesting question that's been asked on the, the Welsh Act, on the, the Future Generations Act. Um, so for those of you who don't know this act, I think the key provisions is that uh, the act requires that the needs of present generations are met without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And having read the uh, complaint of the 16 children to the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, there's this principle at the heart, which is this question of intergenerational equity uh, and the best interest of the child principle that many of us will be familiar with. Um, I, I would like to ask the, the panel uh, what you think the potential of this principle of intergenerational equity in light of sustainable development goals and so on can be for the protection of public health and the environment. I think that's uh, me packing up various questions together as one. And uh, secondly, I would like to ask when we're talking about uh, strategic litigation linking to the remarks uh, Yamina was making on standing, at what level should we really uh, consider strategic litigation as the most effective. There are many questions that refer to local action. There are many questions that refer to national joined up thinking between different communities. We've talked about a uh, regional uh, action before European Court of Human Rights and possibly others. We've talked about global uh, fora, such as the Committee on the Rights of a Child and others. So uh, is there any sense that there are some actions that may be more effective than others or how can can they be complementary? Uh, two questions for the panel, uh, please. Uh, Yamina, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you very much. Maybe I start from the end, actually, <laughs> from the strategic litigation uh, actions. From my experience, I just grow more and more to understand and see strategic litigations as just one of the toolbox. And we need to see this, that we citizens, we have a variety of tools to press uh, our governments and elected representatives, how we want them to actually implement the policies and the actions that we think are the best for us and future of our kids or next generations. And litigation is just a small part of it. So, uh, and we should always see it like this. So when we think about the advocacy, litigation can enforce this advocacy and uh, can uh, open some doors, uh, highlight some pressure problems. But of course, it's not a silver bullet. We're going to solve all the issues. And then because after, even if we have a powerful and beautiful judgment, the implementation of that judgment sometimes, sometimes takes years and it's another battle to take. So, and when it comes to the future generations, mm, as far as I uh, a sign of everything what is being said about the uh, need for us to think more uh, equality and more uh, uh, considering future generations, I also think that the battles on climate, it's not only about future generations, it's about us here and now. Because of course, I mean, we are on different ages, some of us have kids, some of us have, our friends have kids. And so those generations who are already here, will suffer this effect. And so it's not, we should not have this illusion that uh, it's only about the future generations and us, we are at the kind of safe pace and we can kind of manage to the end because it's not uh, given. So uh, although I think we should take in as lawyers into thinking, and include in our legal arguments, but uh, just as an additional point, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I think Marina, you are next, then Marlies, and then Richard. <laughs> I mean, I will agree with you. Um, I was gonna say this is a, more, a, a problem today and now, um, but there is an intergenerational issue, obviously, 
Um, it comes from our parents, our, the past generation that was the big polluted industrial revolution up until today and will keep on for the future. Um, one of the key findings that we had a few years ago in our report that was our stark finding back then was that as things are getting worse, every child born today will see a future of climate change impacts to their health. So we're depriving the future generations of the healthy life that we were able to live relatively until now, and we're already suffering the impacts as uh, Irmina highlighted rightfully. So it's important to bear in mind that a child born today will see a future. If they live up, up until their age of 80, they will see that future of 1.5 degrees if we act really fast, most likely they will see a future of four degrees and that is quite So it's acutely important that we bear that in mind because the next generation is here today and that does represent an important issue of rights as well for the children that are facing these problems. Marlies? Yes, no, I also fully agree with the two previous speakers because especially we know that if we want to achieve a warming below 1.5 degrees or well below 2 degrees, this needs to be realized within this generation, right? We are talking about time frames of 2050 when, when many of us will still be around, uh, let alone people that are much younger. Uh, so I think it is need about these generations, keeping in mind the next ones. Um, and about the, the, the question, is strategic litigation a magic bullet, uh, maybe, perhaps? Uh, the answer would, would be no, it is indeed uh, a, a tool in the toolbox. But strategic litigation in particular uh, uh, needs to go hand in hand with social mobilization precisely because it is about these wider structural questions. And I think the, the overlying element is accountability. And sometimes you can get accountability through the courts or trying to force something or, or open up a door that has been closed for a long time. But ultimately it needs to exist uh, uh, next to each other. Um, and, and the one can catalyze and feed off each other. And we all need to work on it now in whatever way we can, right? That's the other important uh, message. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Richard. Being with everybody else, I'll be brief. Um, the uh, Future Generations Act of Wales is an extraordinarily important piece of legislation uh, that isn't getting the kind of uh, uh, track marks that it ought to be uh, getting. Uh, many countries actually have laws that uh, deal with the rights of future generations. Indeed, Norway's uh, constitution uh, provides a constitutional right for a healthy environment for future generations. Uh, that's one of the points that we are seeking to have elaborated uh, at the uh, European Court level. Uh, so um, it's, it's a, another important tool to be used uh, as we argue today, uh, this very important point that uh, was just made, that uh, a child born today is going to face the most disastrous consequences uh, within his or her lifetime. Uh, her mother, uh, uh, the, the decision whether or not to have children uh, is going to be taken um, by the child born today uh, at the, the, the time of 2050, which is already so far in uh, the, the future of any government's thinking, because they only care about getting elected at the next election. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's something that I think the reason we take it to court is precisely because uh, we can't trust governments uh, to have the, the best interest of the child in their foremost thinking their best interest, as far as they're concerned, is getting re-elected. And that's a very, very short-term uh, approach to uh, the future. Uh, strategic litigation starts first and foremost with people power. It starts with the, the client, uh, not with the lawyer. Uh, I always get a bit of a smile when I say I describe myself as a humble lawyer. That's usually seen as a contradiction in terms, but I sincerely believe it. Uh, none of us has got that magic bullet and none of us should be starting a lawsuit unless we are confident that uh, those that we're representing have got the stamina, the resources, uh, and that we have the stamina and resources to see it through. Uh, we, we can't just start something and then let it fizzle out. We've got to be there for the long haul.
he says at the age of 72. Bye. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, time is running out. So uh, what I will suggest is that we continue the conversation to increase this join up thinking. Uh, I'm delighted uh, that uh, we've had this first seminar. There are several others, seminars, conferences in the pipeline. So please do get in touch with us. Uh, for now, I'm going to pass back to Farang uh, to uh, continue and conclude this seminar. Thank you very much to you all. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Amandine. There were a lot of questions. And uh, as we hope, um, this is a collaboration. It's not a one-off event. We need to advance the process of having further conversations to advance this agenda. Um, two issues came with, we had a long interview with, with uh, Sir Stephen Holgate and Rosamund Adakisi. And one of the issues is that um, legal processes take a long time. And one of the questions in the questionnaire was, it cost also a lot of money. What are we supposed to do? We didn't get time, of course, to address those questions. But from a pragmatic point of view, uh, as a public health practitioner, all this stuff seems to take a long time, not very wordy, and it costs a lot of money. And I'm, I, I have children, um, and uh, this is affecting their life. And I, I'm reminded of the, of the words of, of Churchill, uh, at the beginning of the Second World War, saying the era of procrastination of half measures of soothing and baffling expedience, or in the word of Greta Thunberg's blah, 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 of delays is coming to a close. In its place, we're entering a period of consequences. And the big question is, what other legal tools and instruments we can use, in, you know, in, in the short term, uh, apart from litigation and so on, to be able to address these issues, not only in the UK and Europe, but also in developing countries where there are some clear issues. For example, in Nigeria, some colleagues have just emailed me. There are issues about oil spills. There are many, many quick questions, which if we can develop this partnership as a global partnership, it could actually lead to some issues. So on, on your behalf, I just want to thank everybody for, for, for joining this conversation. We've had significant in interest uh, with, with this. Uh, there will be a conference around all these things in, 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 in early next year, but I very much hope this partnership, uh, which has begun long time ago, can, can flourish. Uh, Sir, Sir Stephen Holgate, uh, was recently appointed as the Balzajet Professor of Public Health by the Faculty of Public Health. Balzajet was one of the engineers of the sewers. So within the conversation, there was a conversation around how come this is a just a conversation between public health people and lawyers. It's not. Public health family includes engineers, the police. We need to have a wider view on who is responsibility? Whose work is it to do to public's health? And I certainly count the colleagues uh, as lawyers, as public health people as well, because they also improve the public's health. So on your behalf, thank you very much indeed for participating in, 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 in this workshop. We look forward to your continuing collaboration. This workshop has been recorded it, it, and also streamed online. It will be on the Faculty of Public Health website, as well as the UFO website, as well as being in the YouTube. And look forward to continuing to work with you, um, particularly the, the participants and the presenters around this. Uh, good night, good morning, and... Have a nice lunch, whatever. Bye and thank you very much indeed, everybody. Bye.